The following is an HDNet original presentation. Tonight, Invasion of the Landfish, a venomous, prehistoric looking creature from the deep that scientists want to wipe out. I hate to say that we could ever eradicate lionfish, but I think if we put our mind to it and there's incentive, we can really do a number and control these fish. They've become a threat to the ecosystem in the Atlantic, multiplying fast and eating everything in sight. One of the scariest things about this problem is that science is not keeping up with lionfish. We are really concerned about um, the rate at which lionfish are invading. Plus, poverty in America, an unconventional bank from the third world that's stepping in to help this country's poorest of the poor. Microfinance has given poor people a new way to manage their money. That doesn't mean that it's lifted them out of poverty, but it has given them freedom. It's given them more control over their lives. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. Good evening. This thin strip of an island in the Bahamas looks like a peaceful postcard. Its coral reefs and many other attributes draw tourists from all over the world. But a few years back, a little visitor came to these waters for the first time and decided to stay. And now, this tropical paradise is being threatened with environmental disaster. Meet the enemy, lionfish, with their vibrant zebra stripes and needle-sharp spines filled with venom, these interlopers from halfway around the globe look like something out of a science fiction movie. Averaging only 12 inches long, these menacing newcomers are taking over, eating everything in sight. That kind of voracious appetite could spell disaster for delicate ecosystems and for the commercial fishing industry. The legend of the lionfish goes something like this. Prized as exotic pets, a handful of them were swimming in a tank on a dock in Florida in the early 1990s when Hurricane Andrew hit. The tank toppled into the ocean. The fish escaped and rapidly multiplied. Most scientists don't think the lionfish invasion began on that fateful day, but it's a near certainty that it did all start with a few unwanted pets dumped into the sea. No one knows for sure how many of these destructive intruders are now swimming about the Western Atlantic, but estimates run into the millions. Well, if you had to design a perfect invader, lionfish would be very close to that perfect invader. Lad Akins has dedicated his life to fighting the lionfish invasion. He's a conservationist and researcher with the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. Island School, Island School, Edgewater on 1-6. We caught up with him here in the rustic Bahamian out island of Eleuthera. Home of some of the highest concentrations of lionfish. A lot of us are worried about overfishing. Put that in context with the lionfish. Well, the lionfish is doing the overfishing for us right now. It's out there every day consuming things at unsustainable rates. And those impacts could be far more severe than the actions of the human population out there fishing. And they're doing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. Part of the issue is it's a problem that's sneaking in the back door. This isn't climate change or overfishing or coral disease and bleaching uh, that most people, at least in the marine science community, are dealing with. This is brand new. This is something nobody saw on the radar screen, but it could trump all of those things. Lionfish are native to the Indo-Pacific, far from the waters off the eastern United States. And although sporadic lionfish sightings were not unheard of in the past, it wasn't until the year 2000 that they started showing up in large concentrations off the Florida coast. 
Year by year, the lionfish are staking claim to more and more western waters at a staggering rate. As you can see with this data provided by the U.S. government, by 2001, they had settled in North Carolina and were spending summers as far north as New England. By 2004, they infested the Bahamas, and in 2007, most of the Caribbean islands were overrun. By 2009, lionfish spread throughout the northern shores of Central and South America, and just last year, they hit the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists expect them to eventually make their way as far south as Argentina. It's an incredible explosion. It's like a wildfire. And not only the geographic spread, but the density of those fish follows that same pattern. And, and everyone is scrambling, trying to figure out what are we going to do about this. Well, what do we know about lionfish? How much do we know about them? You know, they grow fairly rapidly. They reproduce frequently, as often as every four days, with 30,000 eggs per spawning event. And we know we're seeing lionfish in incredible abundances on these sites in the Caribbean now. One of the reasons lionfish have traveled so far from where they were originally released in Florida is that those tens of thousands of eggs get carried along the ocean currents, sending them miles from where they were originally spawned. Much of what Aikens has learned has come from following the trail of lionfish outbreaks throughout the Caribbean. He is constantly traveling to research, educate, and assist communities infested with this growing threat. We've been documenting the impact, but also looking at whether or not removal can be effective. Along with fellow researcher Stephanie Green, they're trying to find out everything they can about lionfish and how these voracious eaters are affecting their non-native waters. From surveying the ocean floor, to tagging and tracking lionfish, to tackling the question many local communities are most worried about, just what are the lionfish eating? You wouldn't believe the appetites on these fish. We've documented almost 60 different species of Caribbean fish in lionfish stomachs. So the impacts of lionfish could be very severe through such a broad and gluttonous predation. Understanding those impacts is more than a full-time job. So then we open it up to see what's going on inside. We can determine sex and look at what it's been eating and all kinds of stuff. After a long day spent mostly underwater, the team heads back to the lab for an evening of dissections and data collection. The stomach is right in here. One of the first things they're anxious to find out is what's on the menu for lionfish. The night we were there, while looking inside the stomach of one of that day's catch, a new discovery. You know what? Is that a razorfish? It is a razorfish. <gasps> Yet another species is found. The list of what lionfish eats keeps growing. These are actually very rare. On our surveys, when we go down and, right. and count all of the fish on reefs, we don't see these very often. So but he swallows those things whole. Whole. So look at the size of this lionfish compared to this fish. Mm -hmm. You imagine lionfish can only eat things that will fit in their mouth. So somehow right. this lionfish managed to sneak up on this fish and take him whole, right. probably from probably from behind, just mm -hmm. straight up. Yeah, that's an that's an impressive fish. I don't think I I've seen one. I, I haven't, I haven't seen a razorfish, I don't think, in any of the surveys we've done here. No. If you wanted one image that captures the threat posed by these predators, here's one Aikens often shows. When this lionfish was dissected, 21 juvenile fish were found in its stomach. It's images like this that Lad Aikens says points to a dangerous future for both fishermen and coral reefs. According to Aikens, it's the younger generations that are getting wiped out. In fact, one Oregon State University study showed a single lionfish can kill three quarters of the small fish on a coral patch reef in just five weeks. What would you classify as a worst case, maybe the worst case scenario? I hate to go worst case, but I could, I could say that we may see some dramatic impacts to our native fish populations and that includes commercially valuable species like grouper and snapper, which are, as juveniles, prey for lionfish. If the juveniles can't grow into full-sized fish, there may soon come a day when the fishermen's boats come back empty, and lionfish favorites like grouper and snapper will no longer appear on our plates. But it doesn't stop there. Also ecologically important species. Um, 
juvenile parrotfish that clean uh, the algae off reef areas and, and protect the corals from being overgrown by algae. Cleaner species that help pick parasites off other fish. And when those things start to become affected, it's a very connected system and we may see impacts that, that we can't even imagine right now. The presence of landfish could start a chain reaction that has the potential to devastate ocean environments. If they eat all the fish that consume the algae, then that algae could overgrow on the coral, causing the coral to suffocate and die. With the coral gone, a whole underwater landscape could be thrown into chaos. Degradation of coral reefs, um, maybe impacts to economies, erosion to shorelines because of those corals being impacted. And I don't want to say that's what's going to happen, but those are all, all potential scenarios. I extinction of some species of fish could be a possibility. And standard length is 275. With those kinds of consequences on the table, even the U.S. government is not taking lionfish lightly. They put their own man on the job. So today we're out collecting lionfish for biology and ecology assessments that we're conducting off the coast of North Carolina. So this is the um, first place that lionfish was documented as established back in around 2000. And so James Morris is a scientist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in North Carolina. He earned his Ph.D. writing about lionfish, and now the government has put him in charge of studying every aspect of their behavior. This day, he's joined by a team of volunteer divers gathering lionfish for scientific study. Do you want, like, big lionfish or small lionfish or...? The, the great big ones are typically males, so for the live collections, we're looking for females, but we want them sexually mature, so anything basically bigger than six inches is what we're looking for. So today we took out about 15 divers and we collected probably about 50 to 60 lionfish. And to gather all those fish, volunteers will have to use more than fishing poles. Each lionfish has to be individually caught by a diver with a hand net or a spear. There are no successful lionfish traps. And because they stick close to structures like coral or underwater wrecks, they are rarely seen in trawling nets used by commercial fishermen. Everything that we're learning is brand new science. It's, it's things that have not been studied before. And um, it's very challenging uh, because we really do not have approaches. We do not have methods and we do not have scientific approaches that are, that are tested to deal with this problem. Now we are um, trying to develop those approaches. See how they spread their uh, pectoral rays? a bit of a defense mechanism, makes them appear larger than they are. To get a better understanding of lionfish, Morris has been conducting a series of experiments here in his wet lab to determine exactly what conditions affect their behavior. We do a lot of ecological physiology, how much they eat, what is their metabolism, how fast do they grow, what is their temperature tolerance. One of the scariest things about this problem is that science is not keeping up with lionfish. We are really concerned about um, the rate of which lionfish are invading. Through his research, Morris has been able to answer a number of questions about this mysterious new species. But there are some secrets about lionfish that call for a different expertise. Do you have that picture of the gel we just did? I do. So he brings some of his specimens here to the neighboring Duke Marine Laboratory for DNA testing. We have been working with uh, researchers at Duke University and University of North Carolina at Wilmington to uh, quantify the genetics of lionfish, looking through the lionfish population and seeing how many different genotypes there are. Right. There's a chance that, that the same polymorphism exists in other fish. Right. Right. And so, but it's a pretty, it's an outside chance. Yeah. You know, this time we found, I think, eight or less different genotypes, which would imply, as we know, uh, that this was a bottleneck. Um, that there were a few individuals that were released and that those individuals have rapidly expanded. It also tells That means that even though some lionfish may have appeared before that tank in Florida tipped into the sea, the estimated millions of lionfish now present in the Atlantic and Caribbean descended from less than 10 original female fish. 
they are armed to invade. They have become a really rapidly invasive species and they have a lot of tools in their toolkit that have allowed them to do that. So we know what the lionfish eats. What eats a lionfish? That is a very good question and we really don't know that. There are very few studies that have found lionfish in stomachs of other fish. They're equipped with venomous spines to deter predators, so very few things will eat a lionfish because of that. So if you were to reach down and grab one of these fish barehanded, you get a very nasty, very painful sting. I don't suppose I'll be doing that then. Well, <laughs> we, we do have some special gloves. These are, are made for industrial and hospital applications, and they're puncture-proof. So using these gloves, we can reach down and handle the fish. Here's our big fish, and of course you can see these very prominent spines. That's five or six inch spine. Mm -hmm. And each one of those has grooves along the side of the spine that contain uh, glandular venom tissue. And it's all surrounded by this skin-like skin, skin -like covering. You are not likely to die from a lionfish sting, but it can cause excruciating pain, severe swelling, and in extreme cases, it can even cause temporary paralysis. It's enough to keep divers and other fish from getting too close. The spines are only for defense and as a deterrent to being eaten by something else. Like a shark or something. Exactly. In fact, we've even tried feeding lionfish to sharks and they're very interested. They come in, mouth it, and spit it out and say, no, thank you. <laughs> but they do. And you can imagine why, all these venomous <laughs> spines across the back. Well, question, if these lionfish are a problem in that part of the Pacific where they're native, why are they a problem here? That is a great question. The, the abundances from the native range are nothing like what we're seeing here. The work that Stephanie Green at Simon Fraser, uh, Fraser University has done out of Vancouver has shown eight to ten times the density of lionfish here when you compare that to the native range. So Why is that? Something controls them in the native range, and nobody knows what that is yet. There's been very little study done on lionfish, but something controls them there, and it's obvious that nothing is controlling them here. So it's like a kid in a candy store for the lionfish down there. Invasive species are not a new phenomenon. From Asian carp threatening the Great Lakes to Burmese pythons plaguing the Everglades. Even insects and plants have been known to cause havoc in their non-native environments. But Lad Aiken says this invasion is different. This is the first time ever that a non-native marine fish has invaded Atlantic waters. So we don't have examples to draw on that are similar to this. Given how many they are, can you make any real dent that, in their population? That is an issue, and it's something that we were very concerned about. But what we're finding is that we can be successful, at least on, on local scales, in keeping the populations down through regular removals. Lad Akins and his organization, Reef, are not just studying these fish. They want them out of the water. So they're putting a bounty on the head of the landfish. Tomorrow morning at sunrise, Derby begins. All right, let's go see what we can see. A few times a year in Florida and the Bahamas, Reef organizes lionfish derbies, competitions that invite divers, fishermen, and anyone else brave enough to catch as many lionfish as they can. My team is named Team Michael Jackson. So for the most lionfish, $1,000 cash, 500 per second, Third place is a $250 Divers Direct shopping spree. Yeah. Woo, 32 so far. It's a wonderful <laughs> way to educate people, but also to remove those fish. And, uh, and it was a great event. The most lionfish of the entire derby with 111 lionfish is raw talent. I can hear people in the audience saying, this is really futile that you have all this expansive water, a uh, rapidly expanding population of lionfish. You can't pick every fish out of the ocean, particularly you can't do it just on a one-on-one -on -one basis, guys going down with a spear and trying to get them out or a net. Then we're the ultimate predator in the ocean, and we have many examples of being able to wipe out fish stocks, even those we want to protect. And so uh, I hate to say that we could ever eradicate lionfish, but I think if we put our mind to it and there's incentive, we can really do a number and control these fish. If you had to pick one thing above all those, 
that you want people to understand about lionfish and what you see as an emerging big environmental problem, what would that one thing be? It's hard to pick one thing, but I think if people realize that this is an issue that we've never dealt with before, and it's occurring at a pace that no one could have imagined, and a magnitude, the impacts of this invasion could outstrip even things that have been on the headlines for years as far as impacts to marine systems like overfishing and, and warming of waters and ocean acidification. This could be a very, very severe problem and I don't want us to get caught thinking it's just a new fish that somebody dropped into the water. In a government lab on a windswept island off the North Carolina coast, lionfish expert James Morris is racing to understand an enemy that is devouring everything from here to South America. See those dorsal spines? Those are the venomous spines right here. Many scientists study species in an effort to save them. If Dr. Morris is successful, his research on lionfish will make it easier to decimate them population genetics work for the reproduction work. For but since lionfish are still mostly a scientific mystery, Morris has his work cut out for him. But you can tell we're jam-packed with work to do. But NOAA isn't limiting its efforts to the lab. What if the answers to the lionfish problem could be solved with a fork, a knife, and a nice saw? And that brings us here to an annual party thrown by a big fish distributor in Philadelphia. There were chefs, restaurateurs, and a government spokesperson. Hi, how are you? Okay. I'm from NOAA. Renata Lana is a communications and outreach specialist with NOAA. She wants to get lionfish out of the water and onto the plate. NOAA has launched a federally funded Eat Lionfish campaign trying to turn the image of lionfish from destructive to delicacy. My goal here tonight is to, to talk to the chefs and wholesalers about what a tasty fish this is and to think about really putting it on their menus uh, and to tell them about the impact. When they make the choice to put lionfish on their menu, they're really doing something very uh, good for our reefs and helping our native fish populations. Over the last century, many species like bluefin tuna and Chilean sea bass have been fished to near extinction. Today, we hear that being environmentally responsible comes with a list of fish we cannot eat. But when it comes to lionfish, the government says, have at it. Our goal is not to sustain the fish on the reefs. Our goal is to fish it off the reefs. It's not native to this part of the Atlantic. It's only native to the Indo-Pacific. We really have no incentive to keep it here. We have every incentive to eat it off, so we can eat it with a good conscience. We can't eat too many of them, so. Lana's message wasn't only that eating lionfish was good for the environment, but that it was good for the palate. The crowd in Philadelphia seemed to agree. I like it. Something new, something different. Very clean, nice flavors, nice texture. We'll see. I think it has a lot of potential. The Italians, we could figure this out. It's not too hard. They learn that lionfish aren't that hard to clean or serve. The venomous spikes are easily removed. Very important so you don't hurt yourself. And from a quick saute. Yes, skin side down. To a dip in the fryer. To sliced up raw and served in a spicy ceviche. Once the strange skin is gone, lionfish start to look pretty familiar to any fish eater. It's got a very um, sort of delicate flesh, a uh, beautiful white flesh, very similar to um, a cross between like a grouper or snapper, but almost like a tile fish. The laws of supply and demand seem an elegant solution to this lionfish problem, but as with all good fish stories, there's a catch. How do you get a fish to market that you can't trap and can't hook? They have to be speared before they can be seared. And that part of the story took us here. To the small fishing village of Puerto Morelos, 
near Cancun, Mexico. It's a quiet, tourist-friendly town where the main square is lined with restaurants and shops. And in the early evening, you can find the local fishermen enjoying the leftovers of that day's catch. But what distinguishes Puerto Morelos from any of the dozens of other fishing villages along the Caribbean is that this one is home to the only commercial lionfish fishery in the world. At least that's the sales pitch of David Johnson, a mild-mattered man from Minnesota who decided to tackle the lionfish problem. Many people from politicians to ecologists have written, we've got to eat this fish, we've got to get this fish off the reef. And lots has been written, but very little has been done. And I'm proud to say that I'm the one who's done something. Johnson, a lifelong fisherman, has a special connection to this part of the world. He spent seven years living in Mexico and even met his wife here. I read an article last uh, November, and it was called Eat for the Ecosystem. And the light bulb went on, and I said, I'm one of the people who can actually provide this fish. He hopped in his van and drove over 3,000 miles from Minnesota to Mexico. He scoured the country's Caribbean coast, looking for the perfect place to start his pioneering lionfish operation. Puerto Morelos not only already had a fishing tradition, but a spear fishing tradition, a necessity for catching lionfish. So Johnson set out to convince the local fishermen that spearing lionfish could be good for their waters and their bottom line. They all thought I was crazy. They said the fish is only this big. Who's this crazy gringo coming in here? And what, what kind of an idea is that? You know, uh, good luck. Persuading these local fishermen to approach this exotic and venomous fish wasn't easy. Fishermen had heard rumors that a lionfish sting could be deadly and that the meat was poisonous to eat. Ramon is a local fisherman. Por lo que comentaban que que era peligroso para los humanos y podías tener una pinchadura y te convulsiones, calenturas, etc., mareos. Pues sí sí preocupaba bastante, solo no solo por mí porque los compañeros igual it took a little convincing, but these fishermen are tough as nails. They are as tough a guys as you're going to run into worldwide. And it was a challenge to them. And because they're so macho and so tough, they said, yeah, you're going to pay us for it? Let's go. We'll get them. And that was that. It was over. They went after them. Ramon's been fishing these waters for years. He and his fellow spear fishermen dive in pairs with a lookout on the surface. About a year and a half ago, he and his partners noticed a big change on the bottom of the sea. Son bajos someros bajos donde existía bastante pescado y en las partes de afuera donde había langosta había pescado y hay ahorita el pez león en en cantidades en muchos pez leones. Ya no hay el, el beso, entonces se, se retira porque pues, se come de todo. Si la, la, la langosta tiene huevos, la, el pez león se lo come. Entonces se va yendo. The lionfish apparently eats pretty much anything that moves in the sea, uh, from the eggs of fish all the way to conch and lobster. They had put some lobster uh, nurseries out and they were monitoring them daily, and they were so happy because there were so many little lobsters. And they came one day, and the lobster nursery was full of lionfish, and all the lobsters were gone. With all the natural species disappearing, including lobster, their, their big money uh, species here, if that's gone, you're in trouble, uh, because the lionfish will never replace the amount they can earn off of that. It's been compared to a locust invasion. Just today, uh, we brought in a lot of lionfish again. Every day they're coming in now. Before I had to ask and almost beg to get them. Now they're just coming in every day. 
He says that last year they caught over 15,000 lionfish, but only half of them were large enough to eat. They were shipped to restaurants from Texas to New York. But since this is the only commercial lionfish fishery, and at more than $30 a pound for a fillet, the price of lionfish is too high and the supply too unpredictable for many chefs. Johnson has gambled big on this endeavor, putting 90% of the equity in his family home in Minnesota behind his dream. But right now, the economics are not adding up. He needs to expand supply, and relying on spearfishing can't be the long-term answer. The biggest issue is obtaining the fish. It's not cheap to pay a fisherman to individually spare each fish. But a trap, that's Nobel Prize if you invent the trap that will only trap lionfish, and we're working on it. Welcome back. Many of us take for granted the ability to save money in a bank or to borrow money without resorting to loan sharks. You might be surprised to learn, though, that in the United States, at least 17 million people are living outside the traditional banking system without access to simple financial services. And that's especially true of the poor. They are called the unbanked, meaning they have no bank accounts, a much harder time borrowing and saving, and fewer opportunities to invest in their economic future. Now, a man who became famous as a banker to the poor in Bangladesh has found a new market in the growing ranks of America's poor. The borough of Queens in New York City is a lively jumble of hardworking people from all over the world. It's the most diverse county in the entire nation with over a million immigrants speaking more than a hundred different languages. On weekends, residents crowd into little parks like this one, where they can take a break from the grind of city life. But even here, you'll find people hard at work. Rosa Pizarro came here from Ecuador three years ago, and she's been struggling to make a living ever since. Her business selling ice cream is typical of the kind of scrappy, informal enterprises that poor immigrants start around here. She doesn't have employees, or a retirement plan, or even a license to operate. What she does have is a tenacious entrepreneurial spirit. But even a modest business like this requires capital to get off the ground. And that was Rosa's biggest challenge. She needed $400 for a cart, $150 to fill it with ice cream, money for cones and cups and spoons, and the biggest expense you can't even see, $700 for a freezer to store the ice cream overnight. Living well below the poverty line, Rosa didn't have that kind of money. And with no collateral and no credit history, she had no chance of getting a bank to lend it to her. So instead, she's taking part in a revolution in finance that some people think is the key to ending poverty. It's called microcredit. The local headquarters of this revolution is a one-room office above a laundromat in Queens. This is a special kind of bank, one that doesn't require collateral, a credit history, or business experience from its borrowers. From here, thousands of small loans are being given out to help poor would-be entrepreneurs get on their feet. But the idea for this bank didn't start here in America. It's a rare example of an aid program making its way from the third world to the first. The man behind it all was an unknown Bangladeshi economist who has become the leader of a global movement. His name is Mohammed Yunus. 
In 1976, Eunice created something he called the Grameen Bank. He started making tiny loans of just a few dollars apiece to a group of poor rural women in Bangladesh. He was stunned to find that even though his borrowers would never have made it through the door of a regular bank, they still paid their loans back on time with interest. The microloans allowed people who were barely scraping by to develop small businesses and transform themselves into small-time entrepreneurs. The Grameen Project focused mostly on women, believing that they were more likely to use the money to benefit their families. It was a completely new approach, using the tools of finance to help the poor improve their lives. It is opposite of the city bank or any financial institutions. Shah Nawaz oversees the day-to-day -day operations of Grameen's American offshoot, which opened its doors in 2008. Nawaz spent decades working side by side with Muhammad Yunus as a banker to the poor. Now he's taking the exact same system that was so successful in Bangladesh and putting it into action in the U.S. Bangladesh is a third world country. It's the poorest country of the world. Everybody knows that. But in my experience, we found that the same problem in the U.S., which is the most developed country of the world. This group of people, they don't have any access to the capital. English is Nawaz's second language, so he can be a little hard to understand at times. Now he's picking up a third language. Poquito, poquito, yo he aprendido español. Maybe the grammar is not correct, but uh, I can communicate. <laughs> the Spanish helps him connect with the Latin American immigrants who are a majority of Grameen's clients in New York. In the long term, Grameen wants to help them out of poverty. In the short term, it wants to give them a financial foothold. Nawaz isn't shy about contrasting these goals with those of a conventional bank. The bank is thinking about how much money they can make. That is the profit maximization objective. The gravid objective is to, to, to remove poverty from their life. So we are thinking about the people. We are not thinking about our profit. Nevertheless, Grameen has a balance sheet that would be the envy of most nonprofits. In Bangladesh, it has given out over $6 billion in loans, 98% of which has been repaid. The interest on those loans has allowed the bank to become self-sufficient. Grameen hasn't needed money from donors there since 1995. It's a different kind of charity, one that combines philanthropy and business. Grameen's success has spawned thousands of similar organizations around the world, serving over 100 million people. Even profit-driven commercial banks have gotten into the game. And Yunus has become something of an international celebrity. In 2006, he and the Grameen Bank won the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. We are creating a completely new generation that will be well-equipped to take their families way out of the reach of poverty. Poverty, it should be into the museum. That Professor you said. Credit should be the, the fundamental human rights. If anybody wants credit, she can get the credit, like a shelter, food, health, she can get the credit. This is a grabbing goal. Nawaz says the secret to offering credit to the poor is supporting the borrowers to make sure they don't fall behind something a traditional bank doesn't do. All financial institutions, they work very hard before loan disbursement. Before loan disbursements, they have a lot of requirements. They have a chart of requirements. You have to submit this paper. You have to submit this. You have to guarantee this, 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 this. So when they approve the loans and when they disburse the loans, they think that they finish their responsibility. But in government system is, to disburse the loan is a very simple procedure. But after disbursement, we start our work. For Grameen and its borrowers, the workday starts when the city is still just waking up. At meetings like this one, held every week at 6 in the morning, borrowers check in with their loan officer and make their payments. Rosa, the ice cream seller, is here with her young son. Cada semana es esa cantidad de 84 dólares, según el préstamo. 
Ya. Porque ve que el préstamo de primero viene siendo de 1.500, el segundo, bueno, yo estoy ya en el segundo préstamo que fue de 2.000, entonces por eso me toca pagar 84, que viene incluido ya la deuda y el interés en este caso. Y lo que yo dejo de un poco más es de lo que estoy dejando para ahorrar. Carmen charges 15% interest, less than many credit cards. And by repaying their loans, these women are also building a credit history, which Grameen hopes will help them graduate to mainstream banking down the road. But before they can receive a loan, borrowers are required to organize into groups of five. And if even a single person in the group fails to repay, none of the other members will be eligible for a bigger loan next time. Si alguien no tenemos el dinero, pues tratamos de comunicar por teléfono para poder uh, quedar, para poder colaborar con esa persona para cumplir el pago. By putting a little bit of peer pressure to work, Grameen itself doesn't have to do as much prodding, and borrowers have an incentive to weed out unreliable people when forming their groups. In America, Grameen has yet to achieve the self-sufficiency it has in Bangladesh, but its leaders say they are on track to reach that goal in a few years. In the meantime, Grameen America says it has given out over $10 million in loans, and their 4,000 borrowers have amassed over half a million dollars in savings. Some of the results were on display at this street fair of Grameen borrowers in downtown Manhattan. Businesses range from food vending and jewelry to Avon and Amway products. Tomamos las vitaminas nosotros y nos sentimos mejor. Tenemos 50 años pero parecemos de 30. I got my first loan in August of 2009 and that enabled me to do my first big festival up in Harlem. I was able to buy the equipment I needed, the big tents, the big tables, the grills. When you talk to happy borrowers like these, microcredit can seem like a panacea. But the idea has recently become mired in controversy. You can't generally get in trouble by saving too much. As long as it's a safe place. But you can get in trouble by borrowing too much. And I really do worry about poor people getting entrapped in debt. It's uh, possible for someone to borrow from several microfinance institutions at once. David Rudman is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., and is currently writing a book about microfinance. He has voiced concerns about the explosive growth of microcredit. It is good to give poor people more financial options, more ways to borrow and save. But it is also important to remember that credit in particular can be dangerous. And in a post-financial crisis world, I almost don't have to explain that. In fact, microcredit has just been rocked by a crisis of its own. The untapped pool of poor, would-be borrowers has proven very attractive to investors and venture capitalists. And profit-driven companies have jumped into the market, sometimes with disastrous results. In India, micro-lenders saddled poor borrowers with far more debt than they could handle. As lenders reaped massive profits, borrowers were driven to desperation, some even to suicide. There was a national backlash with politicians telling people not to repay their microloans. Grameen, however, doesn't even operate in India, and Eunice has long been critical of the profit-driven model. Grameen Bank is owned by the borrowers. So we make profit, profit goes back to them. So we protect that part. So what we are opposed to when you say profit or commercialization, it's a money of the poor going out to somebody else. David Rudman agrees that in many ways Grameen is a role model of ethical micro-lending. But, he says, by feeding the hype about microcredit, even the good guys are partly to blame for the reckless growth. They told the best stories they could about how their work was making a difference. So they went out and found the best examples of you know, women who took small loans and started from nothing and started small businesses and lifted themselves out of poverty. And those stories sold very well. Microcredit is really appealing to uh, the general public. Success stories, Rudman argues, aren't enough to prove anything conclusive. And even what seems like a success story at first glance can be more complicated when you dig a little deeper. Take Rosen. At 9 o'clock at night on Sunday, she is still hard at work, picking up some extra business at another park 
after other sellers have called it a day. But is Rosa moving up or just hanging on? She told us that for all of her work, her business only clears about $200 a week. Her husband gets construction jobs when he can, but that still leaves their family well below the poverty line. So, does microcredit really lift people out of poverty? Several recent studies suggest otherwise. I think it can be puzzling for outsiders to this debate to understand why suddenly, 30 years into the microfinance movement, we've got what everybody's suddenly saying are the first real studies. What's going on with that? At a panel discussion in New York, Rudman spoke to an attentive audience of microfinance insiders about just what the new research means. They found no impact of microcredit on bottom line indicators of poverty, such as uh, how many kids are in school within a family, um, what is household spending, this kind of thing. And that really contradicted the public perception and almost this mythology that microcredit was a proven weapon against poverty. Rudman cautions that the new studies are not definitive. Researchers looked at only a few specific programs over a short period of time. But it's another blow to microcredit's previously stellar reputation. The, the billions that are going into microcredit are going, for the most part, because people think it's an automatic good thing for the poor. But it is not guaranteed that giving a small loan to a poor person is going to make them better off. We don't have any mechanism how to get out the property. It is there, our borrowers. Uh, effort. Shaw Nawaz doesn't claim that microcredit is a silver bullet for poverty, but to him, the evidence on the ground is impossible to ignore. If they don't get any benefit, why they are receiving loan and why they are paying the loan with interest? The first time, they were very scared to receive $1,500. But now, after two years, after three years, they are asking about $7,000, $8,000. And when we are raising this issue, how can you manage your installment? Yeah, I have a good business. So we are observing this impact, this result every day, every moment. I, I feel a bit puzzled by it too. You know, I, I can go through the data, I can crunch numbers, and I can come to my conclusions. But then there are people out there who say, this is great for me. As a researcher, it's Rudman's job to be hard-nosed about the data. But overall, he still thinks microcredit, when done right, meets an important need. Being poor means that your income is much more unpredictable. You don't get a salary. So actually, poor people need financial services like credit and savings more than rich people. So microfinance has given poor people a new way to manage their money. That doesn't mean that it's lifted them out of poverty, but it has given them what Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize winning economist, calls freedom. It's given them more control over their lives. It's almost 10 o'clock by the time Rosa's workday is over. It remains to be seen whether or not her microloans will help her escape poverty. But she's passionate about the difference Grameen is making. It's an opportunity to know where we are to Porque ve que cada persona tiene su interior algo que no ha podido demostrar y quizá con esta oportunidad que ellos nos dan podemos hacer realidad las cosas que tenemos guardadas. Ya está ya guardado todo para que se seque hasta mañana nuevamente. Mañana nuevamente se vuelve a hacer la misma rutina de todos los días. And this final note about Grameen America. It is growing. In addition to three branches in New York, the bank has also set up shop in Omaha, Nebraska. On the West Coast, Chevron just announced a $1 million commitment to help launch Grameen America in the San Francisco Bay Area. And there are many potential customers. Last year, the government reported a record number of poor in America. Nearly 44 million Americans are now officially listed below the poverty line.
Well, that's our program for tonight. From New York, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs or if you would just like to send a question or comment please email us at viewer at hd.net <laughs>